Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, I know I just, I realized that as I tell, told you to sit down, but let's go before the Lord in prayer. Would you join me? Could you stand one more time? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. I knew as soon as I told you to sit down, you were all standing for a reason. I'm going to get down on my knees. Father God, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord. Father, I thank you for, for the, the spirit of joy and the fruits of the spirit, Lord, that include joy. Lord, I thank you that we can have a good time in the house of the Lord, Lord, that we can smile and, and, and just and, and bask in the glory of all that you are. Lord, we don't come into the church to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come in this place to hear from Pastor Jim or Pastor Deborah or Pastor Dan or Pastor Luke or anybody else. But, Lord, we came into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Father, it's in the name of Jesus that I ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us tonight. Father, help us to, to hear your word and that it would be a word that would be a seed planted into good ground in our lives that would bear much fruit. Father, I thank you that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word. Lord, that we can leave this place impacted and empowered to go and do the work of the ministry that you have called us to do in our circles of influence. And Father, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So Lord, I thank you that you would set your hand upon all the churches all across the Inland Empire and all around the world that are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ on this night and all throughout the week. Father, we love our brothers and sisters, our Catholic brothers and sisters, and our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Presbyterian and Lutheran and Methodist brothers and sisters, our Baptist brothers and sisters. Father, I thank you for Emmanuel Baptist. Father, I thank you for Harvest Christian Fellowship, Abundant Living Family Church. Lord, I thank you that you set your hand upon the Way World Outreach, on Ecclesia, on Inland Christian, on Oak Valley, on Crossroads. Lord, on all the churches all around the empire. We're so grateful that we are a, a diverse body, but we all serve the same purpose, to build the kingdom of God in Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I'll tell you what, God is good. Well, I'm excited about tonight's word. I, I, I really believe that God's got something great in store for you. I want to take you somewhere with me, but before I tell you where we're going to go, I'm going to give you the title uh, of today's message. Today's message, tonight's message, I'm, I'm, I'm titled, titling it, Our Daily Life. Our Daily Life. You know, I think we can all say, regardless of, uh, you know, I don't want to preach a, a cliche, uh, you know, post uh, uh, election type message, but I think that it's safe to say that Pretty much all of us at this point, whether or not you're happy or sad at the outcome of the results of the election, I think everybody's got a sigh of relief, a little bit of a, ah, that it's over, that you can, you can resume watching television without seeing smear campaigns, and you can enjoy your neighborhood yet again without seeing all the different names and the different banners and the different signs, and you can drive down the street and not see all the different election things, and you, there's, the, there's a sense of, of solidification yet again in your life, a kind of a, a sense of kind of going back to normality. You're not, not wondering, you're not constantly living in limbo. Well, do I vote yes for this or do I say no for that? I, I don't know about you, but I'm particularly glad that it's all over and that, that, it, that, it's, that it's in the past and that we can kind of get back into to life as we know it. We can kind of push back into to, to the way things were. And I was kind of reflecting on it and reflecting on life. And I, and I really believe that the Lord spoke to me and he was talking to me uh, as I was preparing tonight's message about, about our daily lives, about things that we ought to do every day, things that we do every day. And I want to take you to one of my favorite passages uh, in Scripture. So if you've got your Bibles with me, turn with me to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms in the 63rd chapter. It's one of my favorite passages in the book of Psalms. I remember the first time that I came into contact with Psalms. Now I've been, I've read it over, over the years, uh, a few times, but I remember there was a time, particularly 10 years ago, when I was in university, and one of my teachers, he made me memorize Psalms, the 63rd chapter, and, and ever since then, I've really kind of put an effort into studying it, into getting in the heartbeat of this, of this particular psalm into my heart, and I'll tell you what, it's just something that I continually turn back to, it's something that I continually go back to, and as I was in my studies, as, 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 and as I was in my Prayer time with God, I, I really felt like God had impressed and brought this back to my heart and, and brought some things to light to me, uh, to, 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 to me so that we can deliver and talk about tonight about some things about our daily lives. There's some things that I want to show you out of the book of Psalm, uh, the 63rd chapter out of the chapter there, uh, about things that we can do in our daily lives, things that we ought to do. So I want to take you with me uh, to my favorite passage, one of my favorite passages. And I want to talk to you tonight about some things that we need to do or we need to remember every day. 
Because these aren't things that, you know, as, as Christians that we should do once in a while. These are things that we ought to maintain and remember to do every day. Each and every day. Whatever it is, doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter what's going on in our life. doesn't matter what it is, if, if times are good or times are bad. It's things that we need to remember to do every day. So what I want to do is I want to go through uh, the 11 verses of Psalms, the 63rd chapter. And I want to take a couple things out. I've got four things for you tonight. Now, I'm sure we could probably spend weeks on this, on this passage of Scripture, and we can probably t- pull 15 things out of this. But in order for time's sake, in order to not keep you here till 10 o'clock at night, I've got four things for you that the Lord impressed upon my heart that we can uh, apply to our lives, things to do every day, things to remind or to remember to do every day, looking at Psalms in the 63rd chapter. So you guys are there in Psalms in the 63rd chapter. Let me get there. You were, you were turning in your Bible and I was talking, so let me get there. In Psalms, the 63rd chapter, we're talking about our daily life. Tonight I want to talk to you about some things we need to do, remember to do every day. Psalms, the 63rd chapter. It's a psalm of David, King David. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background of this before we go. It's a psalm of King David when he was in the wilderness. Uh, he was, some say it was when he was being chased by his, uh, his son Absalom who had uh, essentially uh, had a mutiny against David and his regime or his kingdom, and Absalom rose himself to power and and called himself king, and and everybody found themselves following Absalom, and and, and David uh, was running for his life for for, for a period of time uh, from his own son. And, And here's a psalm that David, while he's running from his life, many think that this is when it was written, while he's running for his life, he's in the wilderness, he's out in hiding. And this is the psalm that he writes, and I really, it really blesses me, it really touches me, and I hope, and I pray that, that tonight, I really believe that God will uh, reveal some things to your heart. So tonight I want to talk to you about some things we need to remember every day, talking about our daily lives, looking at Psalms the 60, 63rd chapter. Number one this morning, or this, after, this evening, excuse me, number one this evening, and we're talking about things to do, is number one, first and foremost, is we have got to make time for God. You've got to make time for God. Now, when I say make time for God, I mean that you have got to set aside time for God each and every day. It's not just a Sunday. It's not just a Wednesday night thing. It's not, oh, well, you know, Pastor Luke, here I am at church. This is making my time for God, and that's great. I'm so glad that you're here. But the fact of the matter is, is like with any relationship, if you only, if you're, if you're a husband or if you're a wife, if you're married or if you're engaged or you've ever dated somebody, if you've got kids, you know that if you only gave that person person an hour a week in that relationship, that it wouldn't be a very strong and affectionate relationship. It wouldn't be a very healthy and and, 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 and strong uh, relationship. The fact of the matter is that you and I, we have got to make time for God. We live in the 21st century, and I'll tell you, it's amazing that time has a tendency, I don't know if anybody else is this way, but time has a tendency to just creep up on us, and it doesn't seem like 24 hours a day is just enough time in a day to get things done. I mean, I've got so many things on my list. I know my wife has a, a, a you know, you husbands, you might know this. My wife has a, has a honeydew list that it just, it doesn't end. I just, it's like Santa Claus's list of good names. You've seen that, like the roll that just keeps going and going. And, and, and every day I know she adds and adds to the honeydew list. And I'm like, babe, stop. You're, I'm overwhelmed. I'm just, I'm, I, I can hear the little, the little restart button in my mind. Like I just, I just had to restart because the, the list got too big and I had a, I had a crash. And, and, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that if you and I don't set aside time for God, life has a way of just creeping in. Life has a way of just going about its time. And, and we'll look back on the day. We'll look back on the week. We'll look back on the month, whatever it might be, and say, man, you know, it's been a really long time since I've cracked open my Bible. Man, it's been a really long time since I just got quiet and I just went before the Lord in prayer. You know, it's been a really long time since I've spent any time with God. And the fact of the matter is is that you and I have got to make it a point to make time for God. Now, I had you turn to Psalms, the 63rd chapter. We're going to go there together. We're going to look through this. So read with me. Come with me in Psalms, the 63rd chapter. In the first verse, second verse, to see what David, the psalmist, says about this. Look what David says. He says, oh, God, you are my God. One of the things I want to say before we go any further is I want you to really grab a hold of the heartbeat of David as he writes this psalm. I think that if you read this and if you meditate on this, if you study this, if you take this passage, I encourage you to take this passage the next couple of, uh, of, of days. Just think about it. Read it to yourself or read it. You know, it takes three minutes to read this passage. You got it on your phone or your, or your, or your Bible or whatever it is. Print it out. Put it in your car. Read this with you. And I want you to grab a hold of the heartbeat 
of what David is, is, is saying to God. And he says, oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. Listen to, the, listen to the picture that he paints. He says, my soul thirsts for you. You know that, that quenchable thirst, like if you've been working all day or if you hadn't had anything to drink in a long time and your mouth is just dry. It's just such a miserable feeling, that, 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 that feeling of just needing something for refreshment. And here David says, God, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. He paints a picture of a desert. And he says, in verse number two, he goes on to say, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and glory. So you see, verse number one, David, the psalmist said, Lord, early I will seek you. Verse number two, he says, so I have looked for you. You know, the process of seeking, the process of looking involves setting aside time to do that, 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 that process. I don't know if anybody has ever lost their keys. Has anybody ever lost their keys? How about this? Has anybody ever lost the remote? <laughs> Don't you know that you are going to set aside time? You could get up and change the channel, but no, 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 no. You, listen, I don't care if it takes 10 minutes. I don't care if it takes 30 minutes. If you've lost your keys, you lost your wallet, hallelujah. If you've lost the remote. You know you're going to set aside. Your, David paints the picture. Seeking, looking, because he needs it. Your keys, you can't leave home to go to work without your keys. You can't leave. So what do you do? You tear the house apart in a rampage. Okay, maybe not the rampage. That's just Pastor Luke. But you set aside time. You, all of a sudden, you might have had a priority. I got to do this. 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 And this is the list of order of things I got to do. But then when you realize that your keys are missing, when you realize that something essential to you is missing, what happens? That becomes priority. And everything else that you had to do takes a, set, a side step to finding your keys or finding your wallet or, or hallelujah, finding that remote. And it's exactly the same picture that David says. He says, you know, listen, I, I have this and I have this to do and I've got this. But God, oh God, you are my God, he says. Early I will seek you. I will set it apart to, to look for you, to take everything that I was thinking about, everything that my mind was wrapped in, and I will set that aside for, for whatever it might be. And Lord, I will seek you. I will set aside time to be with you. And then he goes on to say, God, I have looked for you in the sanctuary. God desires. He's not, we've, we've said this before, you've heard this many times here at the church. You know, God's not a God in heaven that's, that's sitting there uh, with a two by four in his hand just waiting for you to come back and spend some time with him saying, man, I've been waiting for you. But the fact of the matter is, is that God, it's like the picture of a loving father, just wants you to be with him, wants to spend time with you. When my boy, my, my little 18-month-old Bjorn is in a cuddly mood and he comes up and hugs me and I just squeeze him. I, there's, there's few things in life that are better than that. There's the embrace of, of somebody that, who loves you and that just wants to be with you. And God loves you. God just wants to be with you and you've got to set aside time in your day, in your busy lives. Set aside 10 minutes to go before the Lord in prayer. 15 minutes. Some people, you know, set aside an hour to pray and to read your Bible. You know, we watch, the average American watches two to four hours of TV a day. But how much time do we set aside for God? To give to God our heart, to give to God, to seek after him like he's something important in our lives, like the keys or the remote We've got to set aside time for God. Are you with me today? You know, everybody, uh, if you don't know this, this passage, it's okay, you'll, you'll know it today. But I know a lot of Christians really love Jeremiah 29, chapter, verse number 11. It's, it's, like, it's like our staple, you know, prophetic verse. It's our staple verse when, when we, when we want to feel good about things. So let's go ahead and put up Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11, well, it says this, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil. Hallelujah, we want peace and not evil, right? Uh, to give you a future and a hope. Praise God, we want a future and hope. So a lot of Christians, we, we make this the staple verse of our Christianity. But I love what verse number 12, verse number 13 go on to say. Look what verse number 12 says. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Listen to what verse number 13 says, though. Speaking about hope and a future, about thoughts and plans. Verse number 13 comes on and says, And you will seek me and find me. But look at what, what it says afterwards. There's a conditional statement there. When... 
You will seek and find me. What? When you search for me with all your heart. When you set aside time to make God a priority in your life. You know, Pastor Jim, my dad, all my life, and you guys have heard it before, if you've ever been here and heard Pastor Jim speak, you've probably heard him say that what you treat as common will become common. And one of the biggest travesties that you and I could ever do in our lives in our walk with God is we can treat the gift of the Holy Spirit in us, to treat the, the gift of Jesus Christ, the, 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 the price that he paid so that we could be reunited with God, to treat that as common. Because what will happen is it's common. You know, I'll be open, I'll be honest. I, I was telling my wife one of the things that spurred me to go to this verse today is I was doing this project at my house and Mondays and Tuesdays were, are my days off from the church. And uh, this week, I, I skipped my, my allotted time. I told, told my wife, I was telling her today, I normally take a couple of minutes and just read some verses and think about them for the day, and I just pray about some things. And I said, you know, I got so wrapped up in this project at home that on Monday and on Tuesday, I skipped my times with God, and then I suddenly, I'm reading uh, Psalms, the 63rd chapter, about seeking God. Oh, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and weary land. Like, well, like there is no water. And I was like, oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I got so wrapped up in my own business. I got so wrapped up in my own interests that I forgot to make time for you. And how fast did two days go if we don't take time right now to focus in on it and to look at it, to make a plan in our lives? Let me tell you something. One day turns into two days. Two days turns into three days. Three days turns into a week. A week turns into a month. A month turns into backsliding. And then we wonder why we're not where we're supposed to be with God. So I want to encourage you today, like the psalmist, to hear his heartbeat. His cry for God, like my soul thirsts for you in a dry and weary land. My flesh longs for you. Church, we ought to long for God. We ought to have such a priority in God that we take time and that it's not an obligation to say, well, you know, I, I, I need to take the next 10 minutes but rather to be joy, to go before the, the throne of grace and make our petitions known, but to do so with joy and, and gladness. Say, hey, praise God, I get to go spend some time with God right now. And God says to his people in Jeremiah, you will search, you will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So I want to encourage you today, some things that we need to do every day, some things that we need to remember every day is that we have got to set aside time for God. Number two, out of Psalms, the 63rd chapter, we have got to praise God, hallelujah, even when you may not feel like it. Fool. Remember, I was just telling you about what Psalms, the 63rd chapter was all about. Here's David. Here's the psalmist writing. David's the king. He's the great king of Israel. Everybody loved him. The, remember, uh, we, you might have heard about King Saul, and, and after David had slayed Goliath, they said Saul, they sang songs about David saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. Everybody loved David. And then all of a sudden, his own son turns on him, takes his kingdom, and here David finds himself out in the wilderness in exile. And look what he says in the midst of tragedy in his life. Look what he writes in Psalms, the 63rd chapter, starting in verse number 3. Psalm 63rd, verse number 3, says, Because your loving kindness is better than life. Right off the bat. God, because you're not God, because I am blessed and on my high hill. God, because I have everything I need. No, he didn't say that. He didn't, God, because things are going my way. But he said, rather, God, because your loving kindness is better than life, sometimes life doesn't feel so good. But David, the psalmist says, God, you are so much better than life. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Look what he goes on to say. I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Church, even when life isn't at its best, there's still reason to rejoice because God is on the throne. 
There's still reason to rejoice. Why? Because Jesus Christ bore our sin and our shame on the cross. Even when life is not at its best, there is still reason to rejoice because God is in control. Amen? And I want to encourage you. Doesn't matter where you stand, if you're up high on your hill or if you're down low in the depths of the valley of the shadow of death, taking a walk through it, not camping in it. I want to encourage you, like the psalmist says, things that we, you and I need to remember to do is we need to remember every day to praise God, even if we don't feel like it. You know why? One thing is it lifts God up. It exalts God up. And we've been talking about humility. Has anybody been here on the weekends hearing about our messages uh, from Hebrews out of, out of humility? Remember, we talked about humility is, is a pride, is self-exaltation, lifting ourselves up. But humbleness is, is God exaltation. Guess what happens is when we lift God up, God lifts us up. And when you exalt God in praise, let me tell you something. It's a reciprocal effect that God imparts love and blessing and, and, and fulfillment in your life. And you may feel down, but when you praise God and when you give glory to God, it changes your perspective on life. And now all of a sudden you begin to realize, hey, guess what? Yeah, my circumstances aren't good. My life is a little tough right now, but let me tell you something. Praise God that God is on the throne and you begin to see things through a different mindset. So we've got to remember to praise God every day. You know, I won't have you turn there, but you know, in 1 Peter, the third chapter, look what Peter says in 1 Peter, the third chapter. I'll go ahead and put it up on the overhead, verse number three. Peter starts off, and this is the beginning of 1 Peter, and he's, and he's, and he's giving a, a, an exhortation to the church. And he says, Blessed be the God of our Father, Lord uh, uh, Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, Blessed be to God, the Father of Jesus Christ, who came and bore our sin that we could be born again. He's given an exhortation to say, Bless God. Praise God, glorify God, magnify God. But look what he goes on to say. Verse number four. Peter goes on to say, verse number four. I'm like, wait a minute, that wasn't verse number four. Verse number four, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. He says, listen, bless God because you have got a great and you have got a mighty future in store for you. And that today may not be a good day, but God has got something great. God has got something mighty. God has got something wonderful in store for you. But he doesn't stop there because that's the easy part. Look what it goes on to say in verse number five. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Now he's starting to change something. He says, who are kept? God is keeping you, holding you. Kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now verse number six comes, and this is the verse that nobody wants to read. And it says, in this greatly rejoice. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Gets a little bit quieter. Because he says, hey, in this greatly rejoice. Now though for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. He goes on to say, knowing that the, you know, that the testing of your faith produces patience. And, and, and Peter goes on to say that there's, there's a reason for it. But did, did you notice that he started with an exaltation? Did you notice that he said, hey, glorify God. But then he says, in this, in that. Hey, listen, knowing that. Go back to verse number six for me, guys. In this, in this what? In this praise that we just went through, knowing that in this time of praise, you have been grieved. So Peter knows full well that we will go through. He knew full well when the Holy Spirit uh, inspired Peter to write this. God knows full well that you and I will have hard times in life. But he says, listen, even through the hard times, glorify God knowing that there's something brighter and greater for you in the future. Jesus Christ, heaven. Eternity with God, hallelujah. So things for us to remember to do every day. We've got to remember to praise God, hallelujah, even when we may not feel like it. Sometimes when you don't feel like it, those are the best times to praise God too. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but I'll tell you, sometimes you just don't feel like it and you give God some glory, you give God a little bit of time, and I'll tell you what, your whole day and your whole outlook's different. That's a whole different message. Number three, we're talking about out of Psalms, the 63rd chapter. Number three, you got to meditate on God's goodness. 
meditate on God's goodness. Now, meditate on God's goodness, I want, I want to express that this is different than making time for God. Now, see, you've got to make time for God. You've got to make a time where you sit down, that you turn everything off, that you turn the music off, that you turn the TV off, and get alone with God and let God speak to you. Whether it's when you're driving in the car, turn the radio off and just listen in silence and pray or whatever it might be. That is making time, setting aside time for God. Now meditating on God's goodness is the other end of the spectrum. And that is to keep a continual reminder of the goodness of God in your life. Not just in that time that you've set aside, but all through the rest of the day. To continually bring to remembrance, to remind yourself of what God has done, the glory and the goodness of God, the mercies of God, like the Bible says, that are new every morning. To continually meditate and think about it. Why? Because what you think about, the Bible says, so when a man thinks in his heart, so is he. When you, when you put things in, when you think about things, when you meditate on the things of God, guess what? That is what begins to influence you and change you and mold you into what God has called you to be. And all of a sudden, the things of God that were, when you first got saved and you read about, oh my goodness, I'm not supposed to be drunk anymore? Oh my goodness, I can't go sleep around anymore? And you think, oh, this, this Christianity thing is so tough. It's, it's just hard. It's not fun. But let me tell you something. The more you meditate on the goodness of God, the more you think about the precepts of God, the more it gets into your system. And all of a sudden, you realize that stuff is death. That stuff, when the Bible says that it, that it takes you away from God, it's the truth. And when you meditate on God, oh, it's just so good. Oh, it's just so good. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says in Psalms, the 63rd chapter. He says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of the wings, of your wings, I will rejoice. You know, one of the things that we were talking about on Friday nights in the Young Adults is we've been talking about the subject of faith. We talked about this word meditate, what meditate means. And, you know, I think in our day and age, you hear that word meditate, you think of orange robe, feet crossed, you know, uh, hands out in, in a weird position with a hum. The word meditate means to ponder, to recall, to bring to mind, to think about, to imagine. So here the psalmist, dear David, is saying, Oh, Lord, I, I think about you on my bed. I, I bring to remembrance your goodness in the night watches. And church, what we've got to do is we've got to remember to think about God. You know, hey, listen, take a moment when you're driving down the road to look at the mountains and the sunset and say, Wow, you know, God made those, but he values me more than that. How about take a moment to say, you know, I just was thinking about this. My wife and I, we were at Disneyland on Monday. And we were with our, our little boy, and he was just having a good time. He was playing, and, and he took a fall. He tripped, and he was running, and he fell. And he hit the corner of a curb right on his head. And it was bad. I mean, Dad screamed like a, like a little girl. And I went and picked up my, and my, 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 my wife, who's nine months pregnant, is scurrying over fences because it was a bad fall. The fact of the matter is, is that we were, you know, we were concerned parents. We're thinking, oh, no, you know, we, we had to take him to the first aid at Disneyland, and the nurse there was telling us all the signs of concussions and all the sorts of things to look out for. And, you know, so we've got this kind of spirit of fear about us. And then we started thinking about it, and he, he went right back to normal. And he's okay. He's got a little knot on his head, but he was out there dancing to the parade and everything else, just having a good time. And I started thinking about it as I was driving home, and I was just sharing with Stacy. We were talking about it as we were coming home. You start thinking about the goodness of God. Oh, God, how good is God? Yeah, my boy fell. He smacked his head on a rock or on a curb. But you know, if it would have been an inch further, he would have smacked his teeth. If it would have been an inch back, he would have jammed his neck. And I thought, man, isn't it amazing? Like the psalmist says that I will dwell in the shadow of your wings. And even though my boy was hurt, even though he's got a little knot on his noggin, we started to think about the goodness of God. Oh, God, how good are you that he's okay? Oh, God, how good are you that we didn't spend the night in the emergency room with stitches on his head? Oh, God, how good are you? How about this, church? Oh, God, how good are you that I have breath in my lungs tonight? Oh, God, how good are you that I'm alive today? Oh, God, and we just take some time to think about God and how good he is. And let me tell you something, life will become alive to you. When Jesus Christ said that he came to bring life and to bring it more abundantly, 
When you begin to think about how good God is and the goodness of God in your life, let me tell you something. Your outlook on life changes. And it may not be good and it may not be great for you right now. You may be heavy hearted and carrying a burden. But let me tell you something. When you begin to think about the past victories that God has given you, the past victories that God has given to those around you, you begin to ponder and imagine and recall. You know, that word recall is interesting. It means to bring back into your mind. To bring, so what that means is that implies that you were thinking about one thing and that you had to change your thought and bring back something into your mind. And what you and I have to do is to bring back as you're driving, to bring back the thought of how good God is. As you're working and sitting behind the desk or, or standing behind the counter or, or standing behind the machinery, whatever it is, to bring back, to think about how good God is. Oh, God, thank you that I'm alive. God, thank you that I've got a job. God, thank you that I'm healthy today. God, I thank you for your healing. God, thank you for Jesus Christ. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit. And you begin to think about and meditate and recall and, and imagine and, and, and ponder the things of God. And life itself truly jumps out at you. Are you with me tonight? Yeah. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. I think this is a fun one too. Last one for tonight. We're talking about Psalms, the 63rd chapter. Things that we've got to remember to do every day. Things that we've got to bring to remembrance every day. Here's number four. You and I have got to rely on God's strength. I'll tell you what. There are times when you just don't know if you're going to make it through the day. But the fact of the matter is, is, we'll see in a moment that God's grace steps in and allows us to make it through. Not only make it through, but make it through victoriously. You know, one thing as Christians, you and I, I got to get in our minds is that the grace of God comes behind us. And that God, like the psalmist says, we dwell in the shadow of the wings of, of, the wings of God. So you know what? We ought to not have the mentality of, I, I'm just going to make it by. Oh, praise God. He, just, he helped me so that I could just scrape by. Even if you are just scraping by, our mentality, our thoughts should be, praise God, God came by me, so I'm going to get through this, and I'm going to be victorious, and I'm going to come out a victor, and I'm going to be an overcomer like the Bible says in Romans, the eighth chapter. And that we've got to rely on God's strength. Not only rely on God's strength, but remember God's strength. Because oftentimes we forget that we're supposed to rely on God's strength. And we try to get through life on our own. And then we do this, and we do plan A, and we do plan B, and we do plan C. And then all of a sudden we remember, oh, yeah, why don't I bring it to God? So we've got to remember every day that we've got to rely on God's strength. Look what David says in Psalm 63rd chapter. He says, my soul, verse number 9, verse number 8, excuse me, my soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. The king that shall rejoice in God, everyone who swears by him, speaking of God, shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. And David says, hey, listen, God upholds me. God has been faithful to me in the past. Now here's David in the wilderness. Here's David with his, with, uh, running from his own son. And here's David says, you know what? God anointed me. God gave me the ability to defeat that punk giant Goliath. God gave me the ability to defeat the Philistines. Let me tell you something. He's sitting here in the wilderness and he remembers. You know what? God has been faithful and God's right hand upholds me. And then all of a sudden David remembers the goodness of God. And verse number 10 and 11, guess what he starts doing? He starts prophesying, saying, those who come against me because God upholds me will fall. Because it's the goodness of God. It's the grace of God that's sufficient for us. A familiar verse, a familiar passage in 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. Paul the Apostle will close with this. Paul the Apostle is writing and he's talking about a particular subject. We know it as the thorn in the flesh. Uh, something, a messenger of Satan he used says that came, that, that Satan sent to buffet him, to, to push against him, to just nail him. Three times he said he prayed that, to God deliver him. And finally, the Lord spoke to him. The interesting thing is if you read in your Bible, the words of Christ are in red in 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. We'll go and put it up on the overhead. Paul the Apostle says to me, and he recounts what God says to him, and he said to me, speaking Jesus, the words of Christ in red, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul speaking, he says, now I will gladly, 
I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, look what he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because Jesus Christ told him, tells you and I today through the word of God that's alive and powerful, that the grace of God is sufficient for you. That, that Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness. So when you and I have opposition, when we have bad days, when we have hard times in life, you and I ought to smile. Remember we talked about praising God. If there's a reason to praise God, right here you go. Hey God, I'm, I praise you, I glorify you, I magnify you. Why? Because your word says that your grace is sufficient for me. So God, I glorify you. Your right hand upholds me. And Lord, I will, promise, I will rest in the shadow of your wings because I know that your power is what will get me through today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. And I will be, like the Word of God says in Romans, more than a conqueror because the grace of Jesus Christ, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it, steps in and gets us through, but not just scraping by, church. But we are victorious. In Jesus Christ. We are heirs and co-heirs. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. Like we sang today, the Bible says, that don't you know that, all, that God works all things to the good of those who are, who are called according to the purpose of God works things out for you and I. The Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Guess what? We can rest assured that God has got our back. And you're not going through life alone. So today we talked about some things that we've got to remember to do every day. Every day. Every day. Hey, every day. Number one, we've got to make time for God. You've got to make time. Number two, you've got to praise God. Even if you don't feel like it, glorify Him. Number three, you've got to meditate. Think about it. Recall. Enjoy life. Look at the flower on the ground and say, wow, God is amazing. Look how beautiful that is. I'm not telling you to be a hippie and all that and all earthy. <laughs> but enjoy what God has created for you. And remember the goodness of God. And finally, number four, rely on God's strength. Don't get through life on your own and don't go through scraping by by life, but be a conqueror in the name of Jesus Christ because his grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect. Amen? Amen. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Let me do one more thing. Let me ask you, just remain seated just for a few more minutes. It'd be a tragedy for us to have a service, to have a good time, to talk about things that we ought to do every day, to honor our beloved mother of the house and, 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 and end service without giving you the opportunity to, to see whether or not or to, to know for sure whether or not you're going to make it into heaven. I want to ask you this. If you were to die tonight, heaven forbid you were to, to, to leave tonight and die, your heart would stop beating or whatever it was the case. I don't know. I pray that's not the case. Would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? Now, that answer, simple answer, but no, you know, the fact of the matter is that nobody would know that answer except you and God. So why don't we go over, why don't we look at some of your answers that you might have in your heart today? You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you think that you're going to get to heaven or because you hope that you're going to get to heaven or you want to get there, that you're going to get into heaven like I think I can, I think I can means that you're going to get into heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can think, hope, or want your way into heaven. It's just not that way. Hey, did you know that nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist or as a Hindu or as a Muslim or any other type of world religion, that that means that you, uh, by default, are a Christian or classified as a Christian, and therefore you're going to get to heaven? Can, can you show me the Word of God where it says that? Matter of fact is you'll never find that in the Word of God. It doesn't say that. Hey, did you know that you can't get to heaven because your parents took you to church as a kid, because you were baptized or Christian, because you attended Sabbath school or Sunday school classes, because you went to church on Christmas or on Easter. Hey, did you know you can't get to heaven because you're sitting in church tonight? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you were baptized or Christian, because you went to Sabbath school or Sunday school classes. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian, that you're going to get to heaven. Hey, nowhere in the Bible will you find that. Did you know you can't get to heaven 
because you're a good person? Because you've never cheated on your taxes? Because you give to the Red Cross to help, uh, to the, help the re relief effort across the world? Because you've never, you know, uh, robbed the 7-Eleven or you don't drive too fast on the freeway? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you are a good person that you're going to get into heaven, that good people go to heaven. Hey, I don't know why we believe that, but I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to tell you the truth and not to play games with you. You're not going to get to heaven because you're a good person. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Did you know that you can't get to heaven because you wear a cross or St. Christopher around your neck because, neck because you call yourself a Christian, because you've given yourself that title? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. Just, just like nowhere would you ever find or nowhere you never become a fish because you went and sat in the Pacific Ocean and called yourself a fish. At no point would you ever become a fish. Just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Did you know that you can't get to heaven because you served in the youth ministry or in the children's ministry of your last church, because you sang in the choir, because you uh, memorized John 3.16 or uh, some other Bible verses because you know some of the Word of God? Hey, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you served in your church, because you were a children's worker or a youth worker or sang in the choir, because you've memorized Scripture, are you going to get into heaven? Let me show it to you. The Bible tells us that the devil himself knows the Scriptures, yet he's not on his way to heaven. A man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus in John, the third chapter. Nicodemus was a leader in his church. The Bible tells us that he was a leader of the Jews, a Pharisee. In our day and age, that means like that Nicodemus was the equivalent to a PhD. Nicodemus had memorized more scripture than you and I could think imaginable. And when Nicodemus comes to Jesus Christ and he asks him, what must I do to get into heaven? You would think because of what Nicodemus did, because he was good, because he served in the church, because he memorized scripture. Because he went to church, you would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, man, you just keep on going. Great is your reward in heaven. But Jesus looks to Nicodemus and he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, Hollywood, popular culture, society, whatever have you, they've made a mockery out of that. They've made it foolishness. You think radical, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart You've given God all of your life. You see, it's God's heaven. You can't get, to heaven, uh, can't get there any other way except God's way. And as a matter of fact, Jesus Christ says you must be born again. You know what that means? God is after all of your heart, after all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Again, let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. And he says, I know your deeds. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa. Shocking statement. Designed to get your attention. And what he's saying is, I better find you in or out, because if I find you lukewarm, floating around in the middle, you will be ejected from the kingdom of God. What Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians will not make it into the kingdom of God. They will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define that to you in, in terms of your relationship with God. Lukewarm means that you're a little bit up and a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out, occasional church attendance. You're kind of floating around doing your thing, doing some of God's thing. You're bouncing around. You got too much of the world in you to really enjoy the things of God. You've got too much of God in you to really enjoy the things of the world. You're riding the fence right down the middle. A painful position to be in. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to get into heaven. Well, then how do we get there? How do we get into heaven? Let me tell you. You can't get to heaven your way. can't get to heaven my way. can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way. It's God's heaven. It's God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, hey, listen, no man goes to heaven, goes to the Father, except through him. You see, so God, listen, God's not after your mental ascent towards him. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. God's after all of your heart. God's after all of your life. Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before his father. He says, if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him before men, he will deny you before the father. So in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible, just like that. 
In a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to know Jesus, to get yourself in a position to, to, to know God better, to know God fully, to get into heaven, to make sure, to ensure your path to heaven today. And when I count to three and I smack my hand on the Bible, three, just like that, I want you to get your hand up. What you're doing by raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my life. I acknowledge that I want to give him all of my life. I want to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus Christ today. I'll see your hand. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. We'll go from there. You say, Pastor Luke, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't raise my hand. If I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. Hey, listen, I'm not going to embarrass you, but even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God? You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. You can't raise the hand of the person next to you. It's between you and God and you and God alone. So who should raise their hand today? If you've never given him all of your heart, if you've never given him all of your life today, in a moment when I count to three, today is the day of your salvation. Get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. I'll put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure, you think, man, maybe I did this as a kid. I don't know. If you've never made a public profession of your faith, get your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it. I'll put it, you can put it right back down, and we'll go forward from there. Finally, who should raise their hand today? If you've been living lukewarm, if you've been running from God instead of to God in a moment, get your hand up. Don't leave this place today without getting yourself right before God. The Bible says that life is but a vapor. You don't know what tomorrow holds, so don't take a gamble on your eternal life that you can't afford to make. Today is the day of your salvation. Jesus Christ has already laid all the groundwork for you, and all he asks for is all of your heart, all of your life. So all across this auditorium, hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you in this place, if you've never given him all your heart, get ready. If you're not sure, get ready today. Let's make today the day. If you're living lukewarm, let's make today the day. November 7th, 2012, the day you go hot for God. Today is a day of your salvation. Don't miss out. Here we go. I'm going to count. All hands are getting ready to go up all over the place. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. I see you. One, two, three. Where are you at? Let me see your hands. Uh, I see an usher over here. I mean, I, I, I got a hard time seeing contrast. Three, I got you. Three wise people. I see you. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Praise God. Uh, is there a hands over here? Anywhere? Eleven, twelve. I see you over there. Oh, is that one hand? That's eleven. Okay, I see you got both hands. Praise God, my friend. Eleven wise people. Where are you at? Number twelve. Where are you at? Number thirteen. You say, man, I wonder if I should. If you're out there in the foyer, raise your hand and usher will see it the Love Rock Cafe or wherever you might be, get your hand up so I can see it. Let's go forward for God. 11 wise people. I know there's 15 at least in this place. Where are you at? Number 12, number 13, number 14, number 15. You say, man, I wonder if I should. I have somebody's flagging me over here. Where are you at? I see. Okay, I got you. Number 12, 13, 14, 14 wise people. Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Today's the day you should. Come on, get your hand up and let's go forward for God today. Anybody else in the house? 14 wise people. 14 wise people. Number 15, where are you at? I can just feel you in the place. Say, man, I just don't know. Come on, let's go forward for God today. Anybody else? 14 wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. I'm going to close this up in just a moment. If that's you in this place, come on, let me see your hand so I can, we can go forward for God today. 15, I got you, brother. Praise God for 15 wise people. Hey, here's what I want to do. For those of you who raised your hand, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, but you should have raised your hand in a moment, we're going to stand together. We're going to sing a song. I want to encourage you to be bold. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart. When you raise your hand, you're saying, I want to give him all your heart. Let us help you. Let us pray with you. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend. If you need a friend, I want you to be bold. You said you were going to give them all your heart. You said you were going to give them all your life. So I want you to be bold. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisles and come meet me up here at the altar. Let us help you. Let us pray for you and pray with you today. If that's you, come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me up here today. You can come. Come on. All over this place. From the family rooms, from the back. If that's you, you come. Come on. Come on down. Come on down. Come on.
You come. You can come. Come on. Hey, listen, guys, I want to encourage you today. Smile, all right? You're not going to a funeral. You're living the rest of your life. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. I want to do something. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is like the nicest guy. I thought, you might, you know, you might have thought, no, 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 no. Pastor Dave is where it's at, okay? He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on, okay? They're not, we don't do that. He's just going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free stuff to help you along the way. Say, hey, I just got saved. Now what do I do? We're going to get some stuff into your hands. And also we want to do one thing. We want to invite you into a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer. They help you build the muscles, make sure you're working out the right way to be efficient and make sure you're getting strong. We have spiritual personal trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you right before service for 20 minutes. They'll buy you a cup of coffee for four weeks and they'll teach you some things about the ways of God and, and make sure that you're going and getting and strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the junk that you came from. That's a four-week program, so I want to encourage you to do that. And one thing I want to ask, I want to encourage you, I want to ask you to commit to, is I want to ask you to commit to 12 months to sitting under the Word of God in the house of the Lord at the Rock Church. You say, Pastor Luke, that's great. I'm going to go back to my church. Hey, listen, I love your church. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but the fact of the matter is, is that God spoke to you here. And if, you, if, if God spoke to you here, this is where you got saved. I want to encourage you. This is where you just got, you heard from the word of the Lord. So I want to encourage you, 12 months, 365 days to get into the word of the Lord. Listen, I'm not asking you to join a cult or anything like that. I'm asking you to listen to the word of God for one year. And I promise you, after one year, you'll look back at your life and be amazed at what God has done in your life. And you will be blessed the days of your life. So if you can commit to that, I guarantee that God will come through and bless you in ways that you could never imagine. So if you guys would just go right over with Pastor Dave. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah.